So as I said, we're gonna talk about the state of biodiversity within our region. Very specifically, we're gonna be talking about San Diego biodiversity, but it might be helpful one to define what is biodiversity exactly, Michael? And biodiversity is really just the diversity of life. It can be genetic diversity, it can be species diversity, it can be ecosystem diversity, all, all of these different things. So we're really just talking about the diversity of life that's out there in the world. Um, and just to give you some numbers, because why not? Numbers are, are sometimes interesting. Uh, in terms of the major branches of life at which you might be familiar with, you got things like reptiles and amphibians. We've got over 91 species within the county. Mammals like this wonderful uh, weasel here, we've got about 122 different species within the county. Uh, a shockingly large number of birds, 521 species of birds, but where we really um, seem to, to bale hay uh, is with plants where over 2,400 different species of plants found within the county. And this makes us the most biodiverse county in all of the United States. And no, I haven't forgotten insects because I'm also the curator of entomology and I love insects, but we don't really have a good handle on how many insects that there are just because there's so many of them. So we think there's over 20,000, but um, it's a number that uh, still needs to be determined. And then the crazy thing is, is that we're also still describing new species. Um, and so there is a, there's a, a world out there of unknown things literally in our backyard. Um, so, uh, so the, the, we, we don't even know the uh, amount of biodiversity that's in the county. We just know there's a lot of it. So why is there a lot of it? And really you can just look at an aerial map of San Diego County and you probably get it right away, right? It's kind of like those Toyota Tacoma commercials where they start off snowboarding up in the mountains and then they're surfing in the afternoon. We've got this variety of habitats within San Diego, starting from the desert over, you know, and, and Borrego Springs, climb up over the mountains into the Cuyamaca, stop off at Julian, pick some apples, drive down through Ramona and Poway, get down under the Mesa tops, and then finally um, at the coast itself. So all this variety of habitat and elevation, it changes all sorts of things and it makes it so there's lots of what we call niches, things, areas for places to specialize and live. So you might also have heard of San Diego being referred to as a biodiversity hotspot. And sometimes people wear that as a badge of honor, but it's only sort of partially a badge of honor because really to be a biodiversity hotspot means that, yeah, you've got a lot of species that are found there and only there. And that's cool, right? And that's biodiversity. If, we, if we're into biodiversity, that's cool. But the problem is, is that area also has to have lost over 70% of its original habitat. So it's, a, it's an area that's special biologically, but in danger from, um, uh, from land conversion primarily. And so, yeah, San Diego falls in this category. The entire California, pretty much the, all of California falls into this category of being a biodiversity hotspot. But this isn't just a problem for us here. This is a global issue. And so the UN, uh, a, a group within the UN releases on a periodic basis, these global reports or assessments on the status of biodiversity and the health of the world. Um, and they released one, I think this one was back in 2018, where there was a lot of concern and concern about the state of biodiversity, but with a, this great emphasis on how, um, nature contributes to human health in our quality of life. So when we're talking about the state of biodiversity, we're not just talking about, uh, you know, the, all the critters out there that we might want to conserve. We're also talking about how that impacts us as human beings, our quality of life and our health. And, you, and I'll go through some examples of that as we go through the talk. Um, and then, you know, I always like to use this, this Global Risks Report 2020 from the World Economic Forum. Um, because they identify uh, the loss of bi biodiversity and ecosystem collapses is, is, a, is a really big risk. It's the third greatest risk in terms of likelihood and severity of impacts. And I always like to say, you know, in The Economist, and this was put out by an insurance group uh, in, in, in Switzerland, you know, when the insurance, the actuaries and the accountants are worried about something, then we're really talking about something that means money. And that is truly the case. 
So the museum on a regular basis holds these state of biodiversity events where we really focus on what's the state of the biodiversity for our region. And boy, this is gonna, this is gonna be like a blast from the past for us all. Cause remember when we could all do this and have conferences where we could talk to one another um, and see each other's mouth move and things like that. And this is what we did in very early February when we were in a completely different time within this world. Uh, and we had lots of people who came in. We provided scholarships for students, had a whole variety of different uh, diversity of, of speakers who came and joined us, a diversity of organizations, all with the idea of focusing on what is the state of biodiversity within our region. So how is San Diego doing? How are we doing relative to this big global issue that is out there in the world? Well, San Diego is actually quite progressive in its um, approach to conservation. You know, a lot of times when we think about conservation, we think about uh, the Endangered Species Act, that this species needs to be listed on the Endangered Species Act, et cetera, et cetera, kind of thing. It's this, it's this single species approach to conservation. And a long time ago, over 20 years ago, San Diego realized that like, in order to sort of balance um, economic development of the region with conservation, that possibly there needed to be a different approach. And this led to the development of something that's called the um, Multiple Species Conservation Plan or Habitat Conservation Planning within San Diego. And so the idea was to, to, to really think about uh, San Diego holistically as ecosystems where we could protect a whole lot of species instead of the species by species um, uh, approach to habitat conservation and biodiversity conservation. That's an oversimplified version of it, but we, we're not gonna dive too deep down that black hole, but hopefully that gives you a basic understanding that this is different. This is, this was, this is a different way to approach conservation and, and relatively innovative. So this was 20 years ago that this idea sort of blossomed. Where are we now? Well, the vision is over is on the left of your screen there, and what you see are all these big blocks of land that are connected to one another. Now, in in these are these are areas that are going to be are slated or hoped that we're going to be under conservation. Well, why why these big areas like this? And it's because you know big areas are resilient, just like you know we want to have uh, resilience within ourselves, psychological resilience, and all sorts of things. We want our ecosystems to be resilient so that they can bounce back from issues that might arise. And one way in which they can be resilient is by being really big and whole and sort of holistic and all their processes being able to happen uh, within a space. But then you see how it stands over on uh, the right there. And it's not too shabby. We do have some big spots, right? There are some big areas here in the South County and, and blotches here and there but they're not really connected to one another. And that's sort of a problem because it kind of makes them these isolated islands. And then furthermore, we've got all these little uh, spots, these canyons, which San Diegans love, and we'll talk more about canyons in just a second, um, that are down here. But these little fragments have problems with it, with them. And a brilliant guy over at the US Geological Service here in San Diego named Robert Fisher, has been studying this almost his entire career and has looked at the effect of these fragment sizes and all these little tiny fragments that we got here along the coast, they're not very resilient, okay? It's these big, big areas over here that really provide a level of resiliency. And so, well, give me some specific examples, Michael. This is way too theoretical. I, I need something specific to think about. Well, let's think about bees. Uh, and then we'll also talk about ants. There are over 600 different species of bees in San Diego County. Okay, so we got the honeybee, that's one species, and then 599 more. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of species of bees in San Diego. And obviously we know, most everyone knows, bees are important pollinators. They're, they're important for our food system, et cetera. Um, then we also have ants. There's over 150 species of ants in San Diego County. And they're important for all sorts of ecosystem services like scavenging predators and seed dispersal. And then they're also prey for other consumers like birds and horned toad lizards. And we'll talk more about that in just a second. So how are bees and ants in these small little fragment, fragmented habitats, our coastal canyons doing relative to um, the bees and ants that are in some of those big blocks of land that the Multiple Species Conservation Plan is, is really trying to put together? 
And some, some work from David Holloway up at UCSD has shown that with, with bees, we see a 30 to 50% reduction in species diversity within these little canyons. So there's something about these canyons that is making them not good um, for a lot of uh, bee, native bee diversity. And that of course is gonna, it has to have cascading impacts throughout that ecosystem in terms of pollination services and so forth. And that's still the unexplored part of this, but nonetheless, we're seeing this reduction in diversity. And ants, it's even crazier. It's 75 to 95% reduction in species diversity. And here we actually sort of understand why that reduction is happening a little bit better. Um, and it's because of the Argentine ant. Um, the Argentine ant likes people. This is the ant that comes into your house late in the summer, right? Troops in, is always getting in, in your business. You're trying to figure out how to get rid of it. Um, this is a, an invasive species. It does not play well with others. It does not like other ants. Well, who lives at the top of all these canyons um, that, that are interspersed throughout coastal San Diego? We do, okay? So these Argentine ants love us they trickle down, right? They sort of melt down into the canyon. They invade these canyon spaces. They don't play well with the other ants that are in there. And so you see this big reduction in species diversity. And now it's a logical conclusion would be like, why does it matter, Michael? They're still ants. They're just Argentine ants. They're just not the ants that maybe you like, but they're still ants, you know? And the problem is, is that these do have cascading impacts because all these different species of ants are all doing different things, right? And Argentine ants are just doing their thing. They're doing their one thing. So we're losing ecosystem services, okay? So that's a problem. But then we're also having cascading impacts up the food chain. Because remember one of the things that I said that ants are good for? Being food for other things, okay? And in particular, horned toad lizards are, ants are critical to their diet. And you go, well, still, Michael, there's ants. There's Argentine ants out there. So the, the, there's plenty for these guys to eat. Um, but there isn't because they don't really even perceive ants below a certain size. And you remember the ones that are coming into your house that tend to be tiny. They don't per really perceive those as food. And there might be some other things deterring them from eating them, but they don't like Argentine ants. So they're in a food desert surrounded by ants. It's kind of like water, water all around, not a drop to drink you know, for them. And you know, when you talk to people who've lived in San Diego for a long time and have spent a long time trooping around out in our canyons, they will invariably tell you, I used to see a lot more coast horn lizards and I don't see them anymore. What's up with that? Well, that's what's up with that is that we've got these ecosystems that are being impacted by the houses up on the Mesa trickling down into what we think is a natural ecosystem, but it's being negatively impacted. So these are some of the ways that these small fragments get mucked up. Um, but these, gotta love them though, man. I'm, I don't know about you, but since COVID has been happening, I've been a hiking maniac and my wife and I have explored more canyons um, than we have. I've lived here for 15 years, definitely explored more in the last couple of months than I have in the entire 15 years I've lived here. Um, and so, and, and San Diegans love their canyons um, and open spaces and, and we, we rightfully should. It's really what provides a lot of the healthy lifestyle living that we have the opportunity to enjoy here in Southern California. And we have enjoyed it for a long time. This is a whole uh, a historic photo um, from the San Diego Natural History Museum's archives where we can see the lollipop guild down here from uh, the Wizard of Oz joined these adults um, to, uh, to set up signs to help preserve these canyons. So there's been a long standing effort to try to preserve green spaces within Southern California in order to provide that sort of healthy living lifestyle that we uh, have fortunately uh, are able to enjoy. And you can see the city preserve systems quite large, 51,000 acres, a bunch of that's open to the public and it protects a lot of rare and endangered species. So even though it's kind of hard to make a living in these spaces, things are still eking, al eking along. So it is protecting biodiversity. It's just harder in, to manage those ecosystems because they lack that sort of resiliency, that springboard of being able to recover from disruptions. Lots of trailheads, lots of trail miles, and lots of wonderful people who try to manage this space with a very limited budget. Um, and God bless our park rangers uh, that are out there. They are really doing so much with so little. Uh, 
and San Diegans do truly love these green spaces. Uh, and, the, and the city did a study of this uh, um, back in 2016, where they looked at just 11 of the 178 trailheads that are uh, with, within the open space preserve system. And they got you know, well over 2 million folks on those trailheads. That was more than four seasons of Chargers in Qualcomm back when that existed, right? And it was in more than the entire San Diego Padres season of 2016. It was beat by the zoo. But remember, we're talking 11 out of 178. If we extrapolate that out, it's probably up in here somewhere, right? And so the point of this is that this is, you know, this is part of San Diego's lifestyle. This is part of San Diego's sort of uh, appeal. It is part of San Diego's tourism. So these, these um, open space preserves that are also preserving biodiversity are important to our economy and are important to our lifestyle. But unfortunately, this is why we can't have good things, right? Um, you know, not everybody treats these areas with the respect that they deserve. It makes them difficult to manage. And of course, this puts even more pressure onto the biodiversity that is eking along and a living in these areas. And, but, you know, God bless the world, the, the people out there who are trying to do good things and trying to make it so that we can have good things. And we've got organizations like San Diego Canyonlands, who's established a number of friends of groups, facilitates lots of volunteer events, lots of volunteer hours, and is doing a lot of education um, and stewardship out there, including, uh, including things like planting native plants, taking out invasive species, and et cetera. So this is a community, we've got a community out there that loves this resource. And there are folks out there trying to activate that community, but you know, we could probably as a community could be doing a little bit better. And I always like have to periodically like to um, insert pictures of cute animals just to like, cause sometimes uh, when we're talking about biodiversity, environmental issues, it can be a big downer. So here's your little cute animal break. All right, one, two, three, deep breath. All right, so, but why should we care? Why should we care about all, the, the, all these species of reptiles and amphibians and whatnot that we've got here or that we're the most biodiverse county? Whoopee, what does that mean? Why, why, why do we care about that? And there's lots of reasons why we should care. Uh, and that is because biodiversity is, uh, holds things that are yet to be discovered that could benefit us. This is a study that came out of SALK, our, own, our very own SALK very recently, in collaboration actually with the San Diego Natural History Museum, where they were doing bioassays of a whole bunch of plant specimens um, that were out there. And they discovered a species, Yerba Santa, which is a relatively common species that you can see if you're hiking around in uh, Torrey Pines. And it, it may hold promise as uh, for treating uh, Alzheimer's disease. So there's this extractive quality that we can get out of biodiversity that we should certainly be you know, uh, appreciative of for our own health, for our grandparents' health, you know, for, for our, our children's health and so forth. But I wanna give you a more um, specific example uh, because something that pops up in the news on a semi-regular basis is uh, things about mosquito-borne illnesses like West Nile virus or Zika was something that was all the rage a few years ago. And so these mosquito-borne viruses make us go, well, that, down with biodiversity, right? We, if we could, let's get rid of the mosquitoes kind of thing. And, and the thing is that in resilient ecosystems, we have less of a problem with mosquitoes. And so this is based off some work that uh, uh, Gary Busarelli did up at UCLA where he was looking at crayfish, like this crayfish that you see right here, which are not native. When it, if you're out like in San Diego and you see a crayfish in a freshwater area, it is not native. We don't have any, any native uh, crayfish within San Diego. So we've got these invasive species of crayfish that were probably introduced as bait at some point in time or something like that. And they're in an ecosystem with mosquitoes. That's these guys down here. I'm gonna turn on my little laser pointer here to make it a little bit easier to see my, uh, my cursor. We've got mosquito larvae. This is what a baby mosquito looks like, all cute, right? Um, and this is what dragonfly babies look like. So this is a dragonfly larvae. So we have this little ecosystem here. And then in this ecosystem, dragonflies, which are native, okay, they eat mosquitoes, which are causing these, or, or are vectors, right, for these mosquito-borne diseases. They're really good at eating them. Thumbs up for dragonflies. 
these crayfish stink at eating mosquitoes. They're just, they're, they're too small for them. It's, they're not effective predators of these things. Um, but hey, guess what? Crayfish are really great at eating dragonfly larvae. And you can see where this is going, right? You can just see the logical progression of what's gonna happen here is that the crayfish eat all of the dragonfly larvae. We're left with these two in a very ineffective relationship. And what do we get? A lot of mosquitoes that are out there. And this has definitely been proven in the Santa Monica Mountains by uh, the work that Gary did, uh, where they saw uh, major increases in, uh, in mosquitoes within streams that uh, had um, crayfish within them. Uh, and what's the result of that? Well, you know, we have these mosquito-borne diseases. It's not something that we can ignore. And there are certainly plenty of models that are suggesting that as climate change continues to happen, we are going to be increasingly at risk for some of these more tropical um, vector-borne diseases. And so what do we do? I mean, when I'm living at my house and mosquitoes are all over the place, it doesn't make me happy. And generally what happens is that people complain about it um, and pesticides are, are put out to cure, fix the problem. But, you know, I think it's probably pretty obvious that when you're doing something like this, that it's not just the mosquitoes that are going to be impacted by this. So again, we've got this cascading impacts through these, um, through the food chain that uh, are very difficult to predict. And so in a resilient ecosystem, we have less to worry about this. We have less to worry about these sort of invasive measures uh, of trying to control these sorts of things. So that's sort of one example of how biodiversity works in a way that, um, that, that if we let it work the way that it's supposed to work, it's gonna be better for human health um, in, in the context of these vector-borne diseases. Now, oh boy, remember the day. This is uh, February 10th. Uh, the only 13 cases reported in California and the 13, or I, no, I think that's uh, in the total, in all of US um, with just, uh, with one of them being uh, down here in Miramar. Uh, this is a long time ago, right? And this was a time when we would look at maps like this and be like, oh, this is a China problem, right? Um, this is, this, is, this, this isn't going to become an issue for us in some sort of major way. But yet, clearly, here we are, right? Talking on computer screens to one another. Um, so, so something didn't go right with uh, how this all went down. So let's kind of go back to the beginning and how does biodiversity fit in with the coronavirus uh, COVID-19 crisis that we're facing right now? Well, it, in the very early days, there were lots of studies that were coming out trying to trace back the origin of COVID-19. Where did it come from? And there's suggestions that it possibly came from pangolins or possibly bats gave it to pangolins and vice versa. Well, how do humans enter into that picture? Why, why, what are, how did humans get it from pangolins or, or humans get it from bats? And it goes back to these, this idea of wildlife markets um, and, and oftentimes illegal wildlife markets in the case of pangolins, which are illegal to trade in where you've got all these animals packed in together, lots of different species, all in confined spaces. They're all stressed out. You know what happens when you're stressed out, right? You're more likely to get sick. Um, and so they're all stressed out. They're passing things between them. And then humans are there too. And humans are get, mixing into the lot as well. And it becomes sort of a hotbed for these, what we call zoonotic diseases, diseases that are coming from wildlife and becoming an issue for humans. And what we're seeing increasingly is this idea of pathogen spillover, right? That we're getting like all this stuff that, that normally humans would never encounter, right? Um, it's, 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 it's out there in the world, but the disruption through habitat fragmentation and land conversion is causing the, an increase in the risk for these novel infections and COVID-19 certainly falls within that category. So, you know, we don't live in a bubble. Um, uh, with the things that happen in Chinese markets, the things that happen in, uh, you know, any, any, any spot on the globe have the potential to impact us. So um, it started off with only 13, but um, we, know, we know where it is now. Uh, we certainly do not live in a bubble. Uh, and and this, this, the, the proof is there every day when we, when we turn on the news. So again, we'd like to take a moment to take a break. 
and go like, ah, rainbows, okay? Because it is gonna be all right. We can make a difference. Um, uh, and and, and uh, we need rainbows to remind us of that every once in a while. Nonetheless, <laughs> um, it, is, it is difficult to be, to try to do better. Um, that we're seeing globally on a worldwide basis that there is an increase in violence against conservationists. Um, basically, endangered species um, have sort of become uh, organized crime business in, in some cases. And it's like, that, that's weird, Michael. Why, why, why would that be the case? Um, and I'll give you some local examples because we're talking about regional stuff. And that it has to do with the vaquita, which is a small, uh, small, small porpoise that lives in the Gulf of, of California, just right you know, at the mouth of the Colorado River is where it really likes to hang out. It is very nearing extinction. Uh, I believe they're down to last year, I think they might have um, surveyed 19 individuals. They think it's down to about 19 different individuals. And the population decline recently, very recently in the 20, you know, 2011-ish, um, there was a resurgence of illegal totoaba fishery. And I'll, I'll give you the, 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 uh, the highlights of what totoaba is here, but you can see that it was sort of flattening out, um, but then it really took a nosedive uh, here. And so we're down to just about 19 individuals that are out there, possibly even less. Um, well, how does this fit in with organized crime? And that has to do with a completely separate fish. People don't care about the vaquita. What they care about is this thing called totoaba. And the, and the um, bladder of totoaba, this other fish, is what they're fishing for. And the poor little vaquitas get caught in their nets and they die. Um, and why, to, why the air bladders? Well, it has supposed medicinal properties. It's, uh, people consider it to be a financial investment. It's just one of these weird things that kind of has developed a life of its own in terms of value within certain cultures. And, and we're talking serious money. <laughs> so this is a study that was done where people were trying to put uh, a Tatuaba seizure in the context of drugs, um, what we normally think organized crime would be involved with. And so you see here that um, with $361,000, that's how much you know, Tatuaba it takes versus this much heroin versus this many kilograms of marijuana. So you know, a little bit of Tatuaba goes a long way and it really has become an organized crime business. And so whereas the fisheries within the Gulf of California used to be, um, you know, at a very, not necessarily at this big heavy duty industrial level. Um, and, and that wasn't necessarily good um, for the vaquitas. Vaquitas were suffering. We saw those declines in their numbers. It was still a, a, a slower decline. But then organized crime gets involved and says, hey, there's money to be made here with these Tatuaba swim bladders. And we see this massive increase in fishing um, within the last decade. And um, this has led to conflict between the fishery groups who are just trying to make, the, the, I mean, these are local fishermen They're, that, that are, their livelihood is dependent upon what they can extract from the sea. Um, but, the, but they are being confronted with environmental groups who rightfully want to protect the vaquita, okay? And so there's being conflict within that area so much so that is the, the area around San Felipe, at least at times last year, was considered to be um, dangerous for people to travel within because um, if you looked vaguely like you might be involved with a conservation organization, that at some level that put a target on your back because um, the, you, you weren't welcome if you were part of Sea Shepherd um, or, or other organizations like that. And now, so, and of course, who suffers from this is, is the poor little Vaquita. So I give you this example, it's a regional example, um, and it's easy to kind of go like, yeah, Michael, but I don't like, you know, I don't eat Tatuaba. I'm not, that, that's not, that's not, that's not my problem. I'm not part of the problem on this. And so I, I can't let you get away with feeling too smug about that um, because there's other problems that we have here locally that really blew my mind when I first um, discovered them or realized they were an issue. Uh, and this is an area down around San Quentin, this beautiful dune um, area called Punto Mazo. 
And here you can see one of the beaches at Punta Mazo and um, covered with cobble and a little ponga out there, probably gonna go out and do some fishing later in the day. And this was taken back in 2012 by Dr. Drew Talley, who's over at USD. Here's that same beach just four years later. And it's a little bit of a different angle. And yeah, you can see some rocks out there, but you see a hell of a lot more sand. And it's so funny because when I see stuff like this, when, I think it's just natural when you see things like this. No one could ever pick up all those rocks, right? That, that's that's a, a never ending resource, but it isn't a never ending resource. And people do pick up all those rocks and it has become actually an illegal business um, that is sort of done with, uh, with, with, with no um, permission necessarily, though some, some people might have some permission, but there's certain, they're exceeding their extraction rates, et cetera, et cetera, kind of thing. Um, and so what we have seen is this beach go from cobbledy, where never ending cobbles, right, to uh, no cobbles. And what, what happens? Well, we have massive erosion, as you can see here in these pictures, because those cobbles actually protected that beach from erosion. And why, why are people picking up these rocks? Doesn't that seem so weird? Like, I mean, if you just saw that, you'd be like, well, what's, what's the story with those rocks? But man, do they make good garden features, right? Or they make a good uh, floor in your bathroom. And so we see these things at Home Depot, et cetera, or whatnot. Um, and, you know, it, I never have thought before, like, well, I wonder where they get those rocks and what's the impact of that? Um, but here we've got a local example of what the impact of that is, is that we're seeing erosion. Again, we're no longer, we're not in a bubble here, you know, uh, and what we're doing is in this particular example is that we're seeing a site which is, um, which is a very important from a conservation perspective. It's this entire uh, bay here, San Quentin Bay. Here's that beach that we're talking about at the very narrowest part of this peninsula right here. We'll zoom in just a little bit. This is that beach right here. The very narrowest part of this peninsula is starting to erode away. And what, what once was a peninsula is soon to become an island and cause a connection between these two areas of the bay, changing the dynamics, the water dynamics of that entire bay. And it's a critical bay for migratory bird habitat, but also there's gonna be long-term economic activities that are gonna be impacted by this because this is an important area for the local economy in terms of oyster harvesting and, and, and actually lobsters as well. And so we've got you know one sort of small cottage uh, industry of rock picking is got the potential to damage another industry within that region. Um, and so again, we see how this, uh, the illegal, um, Ill illegal impacts, um, not just biodiversity, but the economics as well. Well, now what? What, you know, what, what's, what's next? What can we do about all of these tragedy of things that you, that you have just talked about? And, you know, in California, we're lucky, right? I mean, California is just awesome. We've got all these variety of natural habitats. You can go to the Sierras and it's, it's, it's just a beautiful place. And I talked about way back at the very beginning, right? Way back at the very beginning, um, that San Diego regionally is doing good from a conservation perspective. Certainly we can do better and we're striving to do better on a, on a regular basis, but programs like the Multiple Species Conservation Plan, all the good work that the um, City Open Space Preserve folks are doing to conserve these habitats, we're doing good. Um, but again, right, we don't live in a bubble. Can't emphasize that enough. And I think, you know, what's happening in the world today uh, makes that very obvious to us all. And, um, but yet the United States sometimes likes to think that it lives in a bubble. Uh, and so the Convention for Biological Diversity, and I can't remember the exact year the, that um, this was first introduced, but the United States here in purple is the only state uh, um, country that has not signed on to the Convention for Biological Diversity, which you can imagine is, is a set of goals that all the countries are sort of united in trying to reach to stem this issue with biodiversity decline and ecosystem collapse um, that is out there. And uh, so this is, this is a bummer, right? Um, and they were supposed to meet uh, in October of 2020 for a new, a new convention. Um, and 
fortunately, unfortunately, that ended up not happening. Uh, and so it is being re, um, uh, rescheduled for later in 2021. There'll be a different government in place within the United States that might have a different attitude. I'm not 100% sure, to be honest with you, about the Convention on Biological Diversity. But I certainly hope that the United States can get out of its bubble and realize its global responsibility to this um, global biodiversity crisis. And but how's California responding? Because um, you know, I said San Diego. We're trying to do the best we can. And in uh, October, Governor Newsom launched a, a, an initiative centered around fighting climate change and conserving biodiversity. And this is this biodiversity initiative is really um, is is really quite novel. And uh, and you know the state's got a lot to worry about right now. COVID nineteen is just incredible, uh, and so there's a lot to worry about. But it's certainly on the mind of California to be more progressive. You know, surprise, surprise. Uh, than maybe the rest of the United States and, and lean more towards what the, uh, the rest of the world is trying to do. So I always like to think that like, if the US never signs the, um, the uh, Convention for Biological Diversity, maybe California will at least uh, embody what, uh, what, the, what the convention is about. And it's, well, Michael, what can I do about all this? Um, and really, you know, uh, particularly right now, it's difficult, you know, be aware obviously of what's going on. But the one thing I would really recommend from a, from a health, come bringing it all back to living well, you know, here in San Diego is really consider volunteerism in ways in which you can be involved with the conservation of our, um, our regional biodiversity. There's lots of different organizations. You've got your Autobonds, you've got your San Diego Canyon lands, you know, plenty of friends of groups, friends of whatever canyon or friends of whatever slew, you know. Um, there's plenty of organizations out there that are looking for volunteers to help do the good work that we're trying to do within San Diego County. And it is good for your health to volunteer. There's data to prove it. <laughs> and this is some research that was done where we looked at the volunteer rate within states and the, and the um, heart disease rate within states. And you can see there's this nice correlation here that volunteering's good for your health, okay? But in addition to that, hopefully, if you're part of these conservation organizations, it's getting you outside a little bit more and there's no doubt that biodiversity, exposure to green spaces, getting into the outdoors is good for our psychological health and our physical health. Um, so it's all intertwined. You know, the biodiversity decline that we're seeing in the world within, within you know, our region of, the, uh, of, uh, of Southern California and Baja California, it, it's, it's intimidating. It can be sort of depressing at times, uh, but there are things that we can do about it that are to the benefit of biodiversity, but also to the benefit of our health and to the benefit of the economy. There is a potential for win-win-win here. And a lot of that sort of uh, framework for, for how that can happen uh, is, is laid out in some of these more um, global efforts like that uh, initial um, bio, global biodiversity assessment that I showed at the beginning of the talk. And presumably, are going to be laid out on best practices and ways that we can move forward in a much more sustainable way so that we can have these win-win-wins um, in, in the next, the upcoming uh, Convention for Biological Diversity. So with that, I wanna thank uh, the 2020 State of Biodiversity Advisory Committee um, for all their help in putting together this symposium that we had way back in February where everything that I just talked about, I just sort of, I grabbed from the various speakers who spoke at that symposium. And they're really the true heroes um, that are out there doing the good work, doing the good research. Um, and, and I'm just the messenger, which you're welcome to shoot if you don't like my message um, because uh, I'm the, I, I put this together, but they're the ones that are, are doing the wonderful work. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, we will open it up for any questions. All right. So I'm looking in the chat here. 
and INC two two two. Hmm, a little bit of comments. <laughs> uh, what? Um, hold on a second. I think I need to change some things here, folks. Sorry, having a technology moment. They happen sometimes. Let's see. It looks like there is a question, at least in the chat, on the um, within the the Livewell Advanced Portal. What are some big wins in conservation here in San Diego? Is a question, um, and that's a good question. This comes from the San Diego Department of Parks and Recreation. I would invite you to answer that question because I think you guys are the, the true heroes. But I, but one that comes to mind for me, just because our organization is involved with it. But I think it's really interesting um, it, and, and took a lot of cooperation. It's an example of when, you know, uh, what it takes sometimes to, to really make a big difference is that there's a recent ref, uh, effort that has been afoot between the Nature Conservancy, the U.S. Geological Service, the museum, um, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, obviously, uh, as well as um, organizations in Mexico, like an organization called Fauna Noreste, uh, to reintroduce the California red-legged frog into um, San Diego County, can, can, San Diego County, excuse me there. <coughs> um, and so this was uh, an effort where um, tadpoles, <clears throat> or eggs actually, were brought up from uh, the Sierra San Pedro Martir down in Mexico. This is a frog that hasn't been in the county, I think, for 60 years or something like that. Uh, and then they were put into uh, ponds, two different pond systems, and have succeeded quite well in one of those pond systems uh, because the, they had to do, of course, a lot of eradication of invasive species, a reoccurring theme of, of my presentation there. In this case, bullfrogs, which aren't native to our area. Um, but so far, they seem to be doing really well. I can't remember the, 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 the total number that they're up to right now, um, but that, that seems to be doing well. Huh, what are some other good ones? Maybe you can share one with us in the chat, um, Jessica. That would be awesome. Let's see. Let's hear it for our park rangers. Couldn't agree more. Um, let's see. Da, da, da coming into, oh, ha ha, ha ha. I've, someone behind the scenes is um, telling me I need to switch over to a different. Okay, here's a question. Um, this is from Craig. Is anyone working on policies to encourage cities to plant native plants in their parks or otherwise create additional links to some of the small areas, each other, right? Yeah, I see what you're getting at. Like, how do we, maybe can, we can connect these canyons in some sort of way. And that is a fantastic question and a fantastic idea. Um, and, and I think, uh, I'm not sure that there is uh, anyone actively um, lobbying for that, certainly at least within San Diego, certainly in other areas of the world. We recently had a speaker for one of our uh, lunchtime seminars that we do here at the NAT every once in a while. Um, who was from Melbourne, Australia, actually. And he was talking about how they are actively trying to do this in um, Melbourne, Australia, interestingly, for the conservation of bees. Um, and so we have that opportunity here. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And this is something that the museum is very actively interested in. We're very much engaged right now with San Diego Canyonlands um, about ways in which we can use our expertise in uh, research and education, public education, to sort of facilitate these sorts of things, or at least start getting the, getting the data to say like, well, what, what would it take to be able to do that? But there can be little doubt that, um, that planting native species uh, is, is beneficial. There's been work that has been done on the East Coast by a guy named Doug Tallamy, who looked at invasive species or not invasive species right because i in my that's my biases here um horticultural plants that aren't native to um the, the the region which he was doing the work 
uh, he looked at the amount of caterpillar larvae that were on those versus the native plants that are used in these same ecosystems or the, 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 that are also used horticulturally. And there's this massive difference that you would expect, right? That, you know, uh, native plants have a whole bunch of native caterpillars on them. Non-native plants don't have very many, only a few generalist ones. And that again has these cascading impacts up the food chain where they were able to document um, decreases in uh, chickadee, a bird, um, uh, re reproductive ability in areas that had high amounts of non-native horticultural plants versus areas that had uh, high amounts of native horticultural plants. So there's no doubt native plants, the more native plants we can get um, out there in the, in the urban um, interstices, I guess, between the canyons, the better. Uh, Jonathan asks, can you give an example of a successful project in which recreational activities and conservation act efforts work well together? And I would say that the birth <laughs> of conservation in America uh, is actually that, uh, because really the birth of, well, let, let me rephrase that. <laughs> the birth of, um, uh, of white conservation uh, in, in North America started with that because clearly there was a lot of conservation that was happening before uh, Columbus came across, right? And, 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 and that's a practice that we need to consider and be looking into as well is that holistic um, land perspective that uh, got disrupted with the arrival of Europeans. But turning back to the question, that um, the the birth of the of the of the conservation movement, the European conservation movement, uh, it was definitely centered around sports fishing and and hunting. Um, and so this was how a lot of it, conservation actions sort of came to be. Those two things working hand in hand. And I'm people who know me know that I'm. Uh, I'm in love with dunes, um, like sand dunes, so Algodones dune system. Um, but then there's a whole bunch down in Baja, California that make my eyes light up when I think about them. Uh, and I'm interested in them from a biodiversity perspective because there's lots of cool insects that are associated with them. Um, uh, and, um, uh, you know, the dunes, of course, a lot of people, when they think about them, they think about them from a recreational perspective. I mean, if you go over to Glamis on Thanksgiving weekend, man, that place is a party zone. It's amazing. It's nuts. Um, and, and there tends to be this conflict between off-road vehicle and um, folks and um, biodiversity, conservation, and nature. Uh, and, and I think we really need to work on that because where we have found the most success is, is when we can get groups to work together. Because clearly these people are outdoor um, appreciators, just like they're, you know, the original hunters and, and, and uh, fishing folks and so, and, and so anglers and so forth. So um, it's, it's a tough nut to crack because people get really entrenched and, and, and we're so polarized. Uh, but um, I, I, I think it's something, and, and something that we're gonna have to think about here locally, because I know you know there, there's conflict between the mountain biking community and and um, and uh, open space uh, you know issues and things like that. And that's another one. It's 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 we're really going to sort of have to come together and think about the, the best ways that we can um, really have some conservation success. By what, but 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 hopefully, while not robbing people of the opportunities to enjoy all of these things that um, really make living in San Diego special. Barbara says, and I'm getting ready to run out of time here. Michael, can you speak about big picture? Get out of the bubble um, with regard to eating and environment, including diet change and organics. Um, I mean, I, I can speak about it very generally, right? But I'm not saying anything that um, probably most of the people who are on the Live Well Advance, you know, um, conference here don't already know that there is a, a huge environmental impact of, um, of, of eating meat. Uh, and 
there's environmental impacts of, you know, shipping in, like trying to eat grapes year round. I love grapes, right? But eating them year round and getting from all over the place is, is not a good thing. There's, and so, you know, the idea of eating locally, all these sorts of things, um, there's plenty of literature and, and sometimes a little bit of controversy about it out there. Um, but uh, it's, there's, there's certainly choices that we can make without a doubt in changing our lifestyle that are probably healthier for us, um, that are also certainly going to be better for the environment. Um, bo -bo -bo. Let's see, Jessica says, County Parks is doing a lot of work to restore native habitats, removing invasives and adding new plants and trees. These are often collaboration projects with several agencies and with volunteer support. So if you see a restoration sign, um, uh, and, or uh, some, uh, something, <laughs> I don't know what that stands for, TIA, I'm, I, don't, I don't speak acronyms, for staying on trails. Um, oh, thanks in advance for staying on trails, thank you. <laughs> it's amazing to see these outdoor spaces bounce back. So yeah, there's certainly, and, and that's where these friends of groups can come into play in helping county parks do the things that uh, will allow these areas to bounce back. Uh, and I think this is probably going to be our uh, chance for our, our uh, maybe two more questions here. Can you address the connection between food choices and biodiversity? I sort of um, just addressed that uh, at, at some level. Um, you know, uh, really, when we're talking about food, we're one of the big things that we're talking about is land use because it takes a whole lot of land to grow the grain, to feed the beef, et cetera, right? And so um, anything that we can do to sort of decrease land, agricultural land conversion and decrease agricultural um, intensification um, while still supplying the needs of the populace is gonna be good. And there's a variety of different ways that one might do that in terms of food choice. You know, clearly, um, you know, I would at least advocate for, um, you know, Go for a meatless Monday at a minimum. Um, think about it. Uh, and then last, last for sure, how much are residents planning of non-native um, species impacting our biodiversity and overall health? Uh, overall health is a tough one and, and, and I'm not sure I can necessarily address that, but biodiversity, I can give you at least one case example and I would encourage you to come to the Natural History Museum's blog um, right now because the San Diego Pollinator Alliance just recently um, did a guest post about monarch butterflies and tropical milkweed and the planting of non-native species, in this case, tropical milkweed, you know, might be a good food source when uh, the monarch butterflies are supposed to be within the area. But if it keeps them from doing their overwintering thing and, and if they're breeding year round um, within an area, that's bad because it helps spread this disease that um, called OE that, that actually um, builds up over time. And so what we're doing in this blog, you'll see that there is a, a recommendation that if you want to help the monarchs out and if you're really committed to growing tropical milkweeds, preferably you're going to get native milkweeds. But if you're going to have those tropical milkweeds, you really need to cut them back in the fall and encourage those monarchs, go, 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 get out of here, go do your normal thing, come back in the spring where we'll have more milkweed for you. So with that, my friends, it has been my pleasure to talk to you through this screen. I hope you found something interesting in there. And, uh, you know, we're, we're always here at the Natural History Museum and uh, check us out and we'll be, we, we will be having a state of biodiversity uh, this coming spring. It's not on our website yet. Of course, it's gonna be um, virtual, uh, but we're gonna, we're gonna try to do something that is just as interesting as we've always done in the past. And uh, hopefully uh, you can find value in it as well. So with that, thank you very much, gang.